Okay, so now let's talk about the specifications of the MIST board itself. The MIST board uses an Altara Cyclone 3. Uh, the FPGA only uses about 60% of uh, the chip when configured as a complete Amiga. It also includes 32 megabytes of RAM and a 48 megahertz ARM processor and a USB host controller with four port hub to connect USB keyboards, mice, and in the future possibly gamepads, joysticks, and memory sticks. It also includes two classic DB9 joystick connectors just like on the uh, classic Amiga and uh, the Atari ST. The MIS board employs an 18-bit video decoder. That's six more bits than what is needed for the original chipset, which was a 12-bit decoder, which gave you 4,096 colors. In the future, the possibility of adding a Picasso board to take advantage of the 18-bit decoder is certainly a possibility since there's plenty of room left over on the FPGA. It also has a stereo audio output, an SD card slot to store all your data, So the features of the Amiga Core on the MIST board are that it supports the Amiga original chipset and the enhanced chipset. It uses the uh, standard 4096 color palette which is also known as 12-bit color and we also have full support for the 4-channel 8-bit stereo sound. The Minimig Core supports up to a 68000 ECO20. This is the same CPU that was found in the Amiga 1200. The current Amiga Core supports up to 2 megabytes of chip RAM, 8 megabytes of fast RAM, another pool of 16 megabytes of fast RAM, and additional 1.5 megabytes of slow RAM. The Minimig Core requires one of the Amiga Kickstart ROMs in order for it to function. Um, I recommend Amiga Kickstart 1.3 for the games. For the software you're going to use under Workbench, I recommend using the Amiga Kickstart 3.1 ROM for this. The MIST board uses ADF files for the Amiga floppy disk images, as well as hard drive images for a virtual hard drive. Okay, so now that the workbench has uh, loaded, I'm going to go ahead and push F12 to bring up the mini MIG menu. So let's go in here and check the chipset settings. Uh, right now we're configured for an O20 CPU, NTSC video standard, the ECS chipset, uh, 2 megabytes of chip RAM. I've deselected the slow RAM and 8 megabytes of fast RAM. There's an additional 16 megabytes of RAM that is available to the core that is automatically added. It just currently doesn't have a selection for it on the menu. So then we'll go ahead and escape out of there. Let's go into SysInfo and we'll benchmark this machine. So we'll go ahead and hit speed and it'll make its calculation. So according to this, we are 12.68 uh, times faster than an Amiga 600. And as far as an A3000, we are 1.45 times faster. Um, our chip RAM speed uh, versus the A600 is almost three times faster. So let's go ahead and take a look at the memory pools again. Here's the uh, first bank is the 16 megabytes of uh, fast RAM. Uh, the next bank of RAM is an additional eight megabytes of fast RAM. And of course the uh, two megabytes of chip RAM. Uh, the next thing we can look at is uh, the drive speed. I'll go ahead and go to HD0. We'll do a quick speed check on the hard file. So we're almost uh, one megabyte per second on the uh, hard drive. So I'll go ahead and go to DFO. Let me put a floppy disk in. And then we'll go ahead and we'll do a speed check on the, the floppy disk. When we do the speed check on the floppy drive, you'll notice we're getting uh, 57K per second. Uh, that's because there's a turbo option uh, on this particular core of the Minimig, which is currently turned on. That can greatly help dealing with these uh, ADF images. So we'll go ahead and exit out of there. So we'll quit out of the program. I'll also show you that show config also says the same thing about what's in the system. O20 CPU, ECS Agnes and Denise, 16 megs of fast RAM, an additional 8 megs of fast RAM, 2 megabytes of chip RAM. Okay, so we can close out of there. 
close these extra windows. So let's take a look at some software. I'll load up the Disney Animation Studio and we can look at an animation real quick. We'll go ahead and hit animate. So the blitter works really good. So we'll go ahead and change the frame rate. I'll say uh, 30, so it'll go really fast. And of course we can slow it down to more of an appropriate rate. So we'll go ahead and quit out of there. Uh, one of the other programs you can run is uh, Scala. Okay, so I'll load up Scala and I'll load up a script real quick. Let's try uh, Rave. So I'll go ahead and hit run. So you can see the uh, demo runs at uh, full speed. Scala is still live today. You could see the PC version of Scala running on the digital menu boards at Burger King, for example. Okay, so I'll go ahead and escape out of the demo. Return to the menu. I'll go ahead and quit out of here. Uh, one of the other programs that I installed on here that can only run on an expanded system is Lightwave. So I'll go ahead and load the uh, integer version of Lightwave since the floating point version won't run because there's no uh, floating point unit in the uh, core. So as you can see, it runs just fine. You can even load up a scene. Yeah, this is a program that you can only run on an expanded system. If you're wondering why the screen capture looks a little strange while well, it keeps alternating between the fields, that happens to be an issue with my capture card. It's not sure which field to choose from. On a computer monitor, it looks normal. I'm not going to render anything because that takes a while, um, even on a mist board, just like it did in the old days on the Amiga. So I'll go ahead and quit out of there. Another piece of software I've been trying to get to run under the mist board is a shapeshifter. But unfortunately, Prepare Mule unfortunately crashes the machine, so it currently isn't running. I do have a Max, though. That's an earlier version of a Mac emulator. That doesn't need Prepare Mule, and that does run. Currently, I don't have the software for a Max in order to boot up to the Mac desktop. So this is as far as I've been. Something I'm going to mention real quick is on the mist board, uh, the output is being scan doubled to 31 kilohertz from 15. Um, this is employed by a chip that's also on the Minimig core known as Amber. Amber provides the scan doubling capabilities. This is the same chip that was found in the Amiga 3000 that did scan doubling and deinterlacing. Currently, it just does the scan doubling and not the de-interlacing currently. So if you do go into an interlace mode, you will get the annoying flicker. Um, NTSC modes are also more compatible with the 31 kilohertz monitors. Uh, the PAL frequency is slightly lower. So if you're going to have compatibility problems with the video output on the mist, it's usually going to be in the PAL mode and not the NTSC mode. So if you check it when you first get it, Go into NTSC first, then go into PAL and see if it's supported. Okay, for the next part of the demo, let's load up a game. So I'll go ahead and push F12, and I'll go over and hit Load Configuration. 
and I'll hit configuration two. I set it up so that uh, each configuration you can have different ROM settings and different memory settings. So I set up configuration two to be Workbench 1.3, and set up pretty much for for like a, an A500. So I'll go ahead and push F12 again, and I'll insert a floppy disk, and I'll insert the game Menace. And I left the floppy disk turbo on, so we can load it real quick. So we'll let that load in. Um, this one has cheats, so I'll go ahead and turn the cheats on. And I'll hit start, and we'll let it load. One of the nice things about uh, Menace is uh, if you don't have a game controller, you can use the mouse. So here comes the game, so I'll go ahead and push F1 to get it started. Okay, I'll use the mouse at first, and you can see the game plays at full speed. It's a full action-packed game, just like it did on the real Amiga. And the sound was great on this game too. It was really enjoyable. Also works with the controller. I'll switch to the controller. A little hard to play with one hand though. The mouse works a little better if you've got to hold the microphone. I'm going to quickly demonstrate the uh, ST part of the MIST board. So I'm going to go ahead and hit F12, and I'm going to go over here to Firmware and Core, Change Core, and I'm going to select the Atari ST Core. I'm only going to spend a few minutes on this since I don't have uh, much software for it. So here comes the Atari ST. It's going to start booting. I'm going to push F12 and I'm going to show you the menus. Uh, so here we, have, we can do uh, Mono or Color. We can select the storage and do uh, floppy A and floppy B. Also, it looks like there's hard file support. Um, in system, it's selected for 14 megs of RAM and 020 CPU. No cartridge. And the interesting thing is this USB I.O. Uh, you can change it to control, debug, serial, parallel, or MIDI. Uh, the next one is under audio and video. Uh, there's another selection for color or mono. Uh, there's also a chipset selection. You can do the ST, the STE, the Mega STE, which I guess is set up for a high-speed uh, Atari ST. So I'll go ahead and hit exit. And uh, that's about all I have for the Atari ST. Here's the um, desktop, the different menus. I'll go to desktop info real quick. So that's the uh, floppy disk image that I've booted. Okay, so that's all I'll talk about about the ST because I don't have any software for it currently. One of the hardware adapters that's currently available is the MIDI add-on that you can use with the Atari ST Core. Here's a picture of it I grabbed off the website. Here's also a picture of it installed inside the case. There are new cores that have been recently developed for the MIST board. Uh, these include the Atari 800, the Atari 2600, the Sinclair ZX81, the C64 core, the ColecoVision, and the Multicomp. The next core I'm going to demo is the FPGA64 core written by Peter Windrich. I'll hit F12. I'll go over to Firmware and Core. Change FPGA Core, and we'll select the FPGA 64 Core, and it'll reset into the C64. So there's the C64 screen. So I'll bring up the menu by pressing F12. Uh, we can load uh, .prg files. Uh, we can change the video standard from NTSC to PAL if we need to. You can also swap the joystick ports, so you don't have to unplug each one. Uh, you can also do a reset of the C64 from here. Currently, the FPGA core doesn't support disk images yet. You have to load uh, PRGs directly into memory. We'll go to load PRG. I'll go ahead and page down to 
to UR Kung Fu. I'll hit enter. That'll load it into memory. Now all I have to do is hit run. So we'll let the game load. Okay, so here's the main menu. So I'll go ahead and hit start. One player. Okay, let me demo another game. So I'll hit F12 and I'll go to reset. Now that we've reset, I'll demo one more game for the C64. So I'll go to load.prg, go down to PRG. I'll load in Dig Dug and I'll type in run. And then up comes the game. I'll push F1 to start. Okay, for the last thing that I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up one of the arcade cores. I'm going to go ahead and hit F12, and I'm going to change the core. And um, i got a few on here. I've got Galaxon, Invaders, Moon Patrol, Pac-Man, and Pengo. I'll bring up Pac-Man. And this will load the actual arcade Pac-Man loaded into the FPGA. You have to use the buttons on the front of the mist to insert coins. And then I'll hit start. A few things you're going to need in addition to the mist board is an SD card, a display with BGA port, a USB keyboard and mouse, a USB power supply, a DB9 compatible game controller, and speakers. The Mist Board with case currently retails for 199 euros. That translates into $269 at the current exchange rate.